in in Leon's October by Roger Zelazny. October twenty fifth. Jill came back to our place afterwards last night and helped to straighten things. Gray Mulk and I slipped out while they were drinking together another sherry and hid it over headed hid it over to the vicarage. The study was illuminated and Tequila was perched on the roof beside the chimney. Head beneath her wing. Snuff, I'm going after that damn bird, Gray Mulk said. I don't know if that's good form, Gray. Doing something like that, right now. I don't care, she said. She disappeared. I waited and watched for a long while. Suddenly, there was a flurry on the roof. There came a rattle of claws and burst of feathers, and Tequila took off across the night, calling obscenities. Greymonk descended at the corner and returned. Nice try, I said. No, it wasn't. I was clumsy. She was fast. Damn. We headed back. Maybe you'll maybe you'll give her a few nightmares anyway. That'll be nice, she said. Growing moon, angry cat, feather on the wind, autumn comes, the grass dies. The morning dealt us a hand in which last night's small irony was seen and raised. Greymont came scratching on the door, and when I went out, she said, Better come with me. So I did. What's it about? I asked. A constable and his assistants are at Owen's place, investigating last night's burnings. Thanks for getting me, I said. Let's go and watch. Should be fun. Maybe, she said. When we got there, I understood the intimation in her words. The constable and his men paced and measured and poked. The remains of the baskets... And the remains which had been in the baskets were now on the ground. There were, however, the remains of four baskets and their contents rather than three. I remember than the three I remembered so well. Uh oh, I said. Indeed, she replied. I considered the inhuman remains of the three and the very human remains of the fourth. Who? I asked. Owen himself. Somebody stuffed him into one of his baskets and torched it. That looks like a squirrel. Why are there squirrels? Owens. Uh. Squirrel. A brilliant idea, I said. Even if it was plagiarized. Oh yeah, I remember that. We didn't do all that much pictures. Go ahead and mock, said a voice from overhead. He, he wasn't your master. Sorry, cheater, I said, but I can't come up with a lot of sympathy for a man that tried to poison me. He had his crochets, the animal admitted, but he also had that had the best oak tree in town. An enormous number of acorns were ruined last night. Did you see who got him? No, I was across town visiting Nightland. What will you do now? Bury more nuts. It's going to be a long winter, and an outdoor one. You could join McCabin Morris, Grandma could observed. No, I think I'll follow Quicklime's example and call it quits. The game is getting very dangerous. Do you know whether whoever did it took Owen's golden sickle? I asked. It's not around out here, he said. Could still be inside, though. You have a way in or out, don't you? Yes. He had a... Had he a special place he kept it? Yes. Would you go inside and check and tell us whether it's still there? Why should I? There might be something you'd like from us one day. A few scraps, chasing away of a predator. I'd rather have something right now, he said. That, I asked. But he leapt, but instead of falling, he seemed to drift down to land beside us. I didn't know you were a flying squirrel, Gray Monk said. I'm not, he replied. That's a part of it, though. I don't understand, she told him. I was a pretty dumb nut chaser until Owen found me, he said. Most squirrels are. You know what we have to do to stay in business. 
We know what we have to do to stay in business. That's about it. Not like you guys. He made me smarter. He gave me special things I can do, too. Like that glide. But I lost something for it. I want to trade all this in and go back to being what I was. A happy nut chaser who doesn't care about opening and closing. What's all involved? I asked. I gave up something for all this, and I want it back. What? Look down at the ground around me. What do you see? Nothing special, Greymoke said. My shadow's gone. He took it. And he can't give it back now because he's dead. It's a pretty cloudy day, Greymoke said. It's hard to tell. Believe me, I don't know. I do, I said. It'd be a silly thing to go on about that way otherwise. What's so important about a shadow? Who cares? What good is it to you up there? Anyway, jumping around in trees where he can't even see it most of the time. There's more to it than that, he explained. It's attached to other things that go away with it. I can't feel things the way that I used to. I used to just know things. Where the best nuts were. What the weather was going to be like. Where the ladies were when the time came. How the seasons were changing. Now I, now I think about it. And I can figure all these things out. And I can make plans to take advantage of them. Something I could have never done before. But I've lost all those little feelings that came with the kind of knowing that comes without thinking. And I've thought about it a lot. I miss them. I'd rather go back to them and think and soar the way I do. You understand about magic. Not too many people do. I'll check on the sickle if you'll break Owen's shadow spell for me. I glanced at Greymonk who shook her head. I've never heard of that spell, she said. Cheater, there are all kinds of magical systems, I said. They're just shapes into which the power is poured. You can't know them all. I have no idea what Owen did to you, your shadow or your intuition, I guess, and the feelings that go with it. Unless we had some idea where it is and how to go about returning it, restoring it to you, I'm afraid we can't be of help. If you can get to the house, I can show it to you, he said. Oh, I said. What do you think, Gray? I'm curious, she told me. How do we go about it, I asked. Any open windows, unlocked doors? You couldn't fit in through my opening. It's just a tiny hole up in the attic. The back door is usually unlocked, but it takes a human to open it. Maybe not, Greymock said. I'll have to wait till the constable and his men are gone, I said. Of course. We did it. Hearing the puzzlement, or the unnatural remains, of the three, repeated many times, a doctor came and looked, shook his head, and took notes and departed. After deciding that there was only one human body, Owens, who promised to file a report in the morning. Mrs. Enderby and her companion stopped by and chatted with the constable for a time. Glancing at Greymalk and me almost as much at the remains, she left for too long. The remains were sacked and labeled and hauled away in a cart, along with what remained of the baskets, which were also labeled. As the cart creaked away, Greymalk, Cheater, and I glanced at each other. Then Cheater flowed up to the bowl of a tree, drifted in, drifted from its top to that of another, then over the roof to the roof of the house. It would be nice to be able to do that, Greymalk remarked. It would, I agreed, when we headed for the back door. I rose as before, clasping the knob tightly and twisted. Almost. I tried again, a little harder, and it yielded. We entered. I shouldered the door and near, nearly closed. Withholding the final pressure, I would have clicked it shut. We found ourselves in the kitchen, and from overhead I could hear the hurrying of somewhat, something small with claws. Cheater arrived shortly, glancing at the door. His workshop is downstairs, he said. I'll show you the way. We followed him through the door, off of the kitchen, and down a creaking stairway. Hello, we immediately came into a large room that smelled of the out of doors. Cut branches, baskets of leaves and roots, cartons of mistletoe were stacked haphazardly along the wall. 
on shelves and on benches. Animal skins occupied several tabletops and were strewn over the room's three chairs. Diagrams were chalked in blue and green on both ceiling and floor, with one prominent red one covering much of the far wall. A collection of ephemeridae and of books in Gaelic and Latin filled a small bookcase beside the door. Sickle, I said. The teacher sprang atop a small table landing amid herbs. Turning, he leaned forward, hooked his claws beneath the front edge of a small drawer. He jiggled it and drew it open, drew upon it. It began to move forward to the prompting. Unlocked, he observed. Let's see now. He drew it farther open so that, rising onto my hind legs, I could see into it. It was lined with blue velvet and bore a sickle-shaped impression on its center. As you can see, he stated, it's gone. Any place else it might be, I asked. No, he replied. It isn't there. It was with him. Those are the alternatives. I didn't see it anywhere out back, Clement said, on the ground or in that mass. Then I'd say that someone took it, Peter said. Odd, I said then. It was a thing of power, but not really one of the game tools, like the wands, the icon, the pentacle, and usually the ring. Then someone just wanted it for the power. I guess, Cheater said. Mostly, I think, they wanted Owen out of the game. Probably. I'm trying to link his death to Restobs now. It would be strange to consider the killer as one player, though, with Owen an opener and Restov a closer. Hmm, Cheater said, jumping down. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Rastov and Owen had some long talks very recently. I got the impression from listening that Owen was trying to talk Rastov into switching. All his liberal sympathies and his Russian sentiments could have been pushed him could have been pushing him in a revolutionary direction. Really, Greymock said, and if someone is killing openers, Joe could be in danger. Who else might have known of their talks? No one I can think of. I don't think Rastov even told Quickline. I didn't tell anyone till now. Where did they talk? she asked. Upstairs, kitchen or parlor. Could anyone have been eavesdropping? Only someone small enough and mobile enough to manage a squirrel hole upstairs, I suppose. I paced slowly. Are Morris and McCab openers or closers? I asked. I'm pretty sure they're openers, Greymock said. Yes, Cheater agreed, they are. What about the good doctor? Nobody knows. The divinations keep going askew for him. The secret I s player, I said, whoever it is. You really think there is one? Greymock asked. It's the only reason I can think of for my calculations of being regularly off. How do we discover who it is? She said. I don't know. And I don't care. Not anymore, she said. I just want a simple life again. The hell with all this plotting and figuring. I wasn't a volunteer. I got drafted. Get me my shadow. Where is it? Over there. He turned toward a big red design on the far the big red design on the far wall. I looked in that direction. I could not tell what it was that was trying he was trying to indicate. Sorry, I said I don't see. There, he said. In the design, low to the right. And I saw it. Something I had thought simply is an effect of the lighting. A squirrel-shaped shadow overlaying a part of the design. Several upright, shining pieces of metal were contained in the shadow perimeter. That's it, I said. Yes, he replied. It is held there by seven silver nails. How does one go about releasing it? The nails must be drawn. Is there a danger to a person who would draw them? I don't know. I never said. I reared up and extended a paw. I touched the top burst nail. It was somewhat loose. Nothing unusual happened to me. So I leaned forward, seizing it with my teeth, and withdrew it, dropping it then to the floor. With my paw, I tested the remaining six. 
Two of them were obviously loose. These I seized. One after the other and pulled them out with my teeth. They gleamed upon the floor. Real silver. Greymock inspected them. What did you feel? She asked as you drew them. Nothing special. I said, do you see anything about them that I don't? No, I think the power is mainly in that design. If there is to be a reaction, look to the wall for it. I tested the remaining four. These were tighter in place than the ones I had drawn. The shadow outline was now undulating among them. Have you felt anything special about while I was about it, cheater? I asked. Yes, he replied. I felt a small tingling at each place place in my body seemed to correspond with the place in the shadow from which the nail was removed. Tell me if it changes, I said. I leaned forward, took hold of another nail, and worked it back and forth with my teeth. It took about half a minute to loosen, and then I dropped it to the floor and tried the other three in succession. Two seemed seated fairly tightly, one about the same. Is that which I had just drawn? I took hold of the lower one and worried it till it too came free. By then the shadow was shrinking and expanding regularly, as if it were flapping in the third dimension, a thickness with parts of it becoming imperceptible to me each time this occurred. Tingling is not going away, Cheetah remarked. I'm beginning to feel it all over now. Any pain involved? No. I poked with my paw at the two remaining nails, tight. Perhaps it would be better to fetch Larry and the pliers, a pair of pliers, than to ask, risk breaking my teeth on them. Still, it wouldn't hurt to try a bit first. I worried one for the better part of a minute, and it seemed to loosen slightly near the end. I stopped to rest my jaws, then promising myself I would have a go at both nails before I considered quitting. I gave the second one, which was located about ten inches to the left of the first, well over a minute of the same treatment, and I found it hard to tell when I let up whether I, it affected it much. <laughs> I did not like the taste of the plaster and the pigment used in the design. I was not sure what lay beneath the plaster holding the nails in place. Not enough of that covering had chipped away for me to distinguish the surface and it covered. Only enough for grit with the lamp with the damp basement taste to come into my mouth. I stepped back. The design looked slobbered upon, and I wondered how dog spit would affect its subtle functions. Please don't quit, Cheater said. Try again. I'm just catching my breath, I told him. I've been using my front teeth so far because it was easier. Now I'm going to switch to the side now. So I leaned again, took my grip with the back teeth right side upon the nail, which seemed to have responded slightly to my cessations. I had it moving then, loosening before too long. Finally I dropped it and listened. Silver makes a pleasant, pleasant sound when it struck. Six, I announced. How does it feel now? More tingling, Cheater said. Maybe some sort of anticipation. Last chance to quit while you're ahead. I said as I repositioned myself to use the left side of my jaws on the final one. Go ahead, he told me. So. I caught hold and began to work it. Slowly, with steady pressure, rather than jerking movements. Which I had learned from the previous one to be more effective. Fear for my teeth, but nothing cracked or chipped. As much as I liked the sound of silver, I did not like its cold metallic taste. And all this while, the shadow itself flowed over my face intermittently, passing before my eyes like a quick cloud before the sun, wrapping me momentarily, falling loose again. I felt the nail move. My jaw was beginning to ache by then though, and I'd switch sides. Cracked large bones with my teeth. I've cracked large bones with my teeth, and I know the power that is there, but this required more than simple biting ability. 
it was the movement that was really important involving my neck muscles as well as my jaws forward and back and then the nail began to loosen I paused to rest what do we do when it's when it's free I asked them what's to prevent it simply slipping away is there any special means of reattaching it I don't know Jeter said I never thought about that how was it separated from you in the first place Greymawk asked he made a light and cast it there upon the wall Cheater said he drove his in his uh, he drove in the nails then passed his sickle close to my body somehow severing it white moved away it remained I felt different immediately it, it will respond to your life Greymawk said if you position yourself correctly and it flows over you but your life must be exposed at the seven points which held it and it will respond to the nails which bound it what do you mean cheater asked blood she said you must scratch a wound on the back of each paw one at top of your head one at the middle of your tail one a mid back the seven places the shadow had pierced the shadow, the shadow was pierced when snuff removes the final nail he must take care not simply to draw it straight out but to drag it downward snagging the shadow pulling it to cover you will you then be stranded with a foot on each of the four nails which held the paws your tail resting upon that of the tail your head extended down to the south to, to touch the sixth I don't know which nails which now he said I do she replied I've been watching and stuff will drag the shadow down to you drop its nail upon your back as the place of the second seventh wound this should serve to bind it to you again Gary I said Gray, I said, how do you know all this? I was recently given a small wisdom, she responded. By the high cat? Hush, she said. This place is not the place. Leave it there. Sorry. She moved to position the nails, and Cheater scratched herself, himself, Paul's head and tail. I could smell the blood. I can't reach back for my seventh, he said. Her right paw slashed forward, opening a bright inch at the middle of his back. It came too fast for him to even flinch. There, she said. Position yourself upon the nails now, as I have instructed. He moved and did so, sprawled motionless. Then I returned to the final nail, taking hold and pulling slowly. As soon as I felt it come loose, I dragged it down the wall and across the floor toward Cheater, never lift, lifting it from contact with the surface with the surface the entire while I had no idea though whether the shadow was coming along with it and I was in no position to ask still if it weren't I guess Greymalk would have said something lead it over him and drop it upon the back she said at the place of my mark I did that. I did that. Uh, I did that, stepping back immediately afterwards. Do you know whether it's taken hold? I asked Cheater. I can't tell, he said. Do you feel any different? I don't know. What now, Gray? I asked. How long do we wait to see whether it's attached? Let's give it a minute or two, she replied. The design, Cheater said, then, is changing. 
I turned and looked. There might have been a trace of movement to it as I did so, but it was gone by the time I faced it. It did look smaller, though, a bit less extended to the left. And differentially disposed to the right, and its colors seemed brighter. I think that means it's in place now, he said. I want to move. He sprang up and raced across the floor, scattering the nails, and bounding halfway up the stair. Turned and looked back at us. It was too dim to see whether he'd achieved the desired result. Come on, he said. Let's go out. We followed him, and I opened the kitchen door without difficulty. As soon as I did, he rushed past us. The sun had come out, and as he flashed across the yard, we could see the shadow which accompanied him. He leapt up onto the wall, hesitated, looked back. Thanks, he said. Where are you headed? I asked. The woods, he answered. Goodbye. Then he was off the wall and away. A Night in the Lonesome October by Roger Zelazny. October 26th. October 26th. October 25th. 